What is Christian universalism? You can get different versions of universalism. Why is it growing in influence today, and is it a legitimate option for a Christian to hold? Our guest today, Dr. Michael McClyman, has written a massive two-volume book called The Devil's Redemption, in which he looks at the rise and influence of Christian universalism. What's meant by universalism, or in particular, Christian universalism? You look at a dictionary, it has more than one meaning, but in the sphere of theology, it has a very distinct definition, and that is simply... Mike, I read both volumes almost in their entirety, Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's fascinating. If I was going to teach a class on the history of Christian universalism, I would assign both your texts. But tell me from the get-go, I'm curious about the title. Why do you title a book or a two-volume set of books on Christian universalism, The Devil's Redemption? Well, I wanted the title to be provocative. On, on my view, a good title should raise a question in the mind of someone who hears it. And actually, you know, there was someone on Amazon who apparently only read the title and they their comment was, I think it's awful that, you know, Dr. McClellan is arguing that Satan will be saved in the end. Uh. <laughs> it's the opposite of what you I wanted to raise the question, like if we think about evil, the ultimate of evil in the mind of almost everyone, while well, Adolf Hitler often gets named, but people think of Lucifer, Satan himself. So. Is it possible that evil at its most extreme will ultimately turn back to good? Mm. And is that the implication of those who say that all human beings will be saved? What about the fallen angels? And so that there actually is discussion of this historically. People say, yes, the fallen angels will be redeemed too. And so I was kind of pushing it to the limit to raise a question. Got it. So you're not saying Christian universalism is a satanic, devilish, version of theology and salvation. It could be taken that way, but we will get into what you think about it and if you think it theologically lines up. Nonetheless, provocative title. Maybe we just start with the definition so we're on the same page. What's meant by universalism or in particular Christian universalism? Well, the word, if you look at the dictionary, has more than one meaning, but in the sphere of theology, it has a very distinct uh, definition, and that is simply the notion that all human beings, and again, you could talk about all intelligent, you know, volitional agents, which include angels as well as humans, will finally be saved. But universalism then leaves open this question about how that will happen, what the process is, and there you can get different versions of universalism. There's actually okay. a book that came out just a couple of weeks ago called The Varieties of Christian Universalism. And that's something that I argued in my book, and it now seems that the universalists are agreeing that agreeing that they don't all agree with one another in terms of how you get to the destination. So if you think like going up a mountaintop, it's like if everyone arrives at the summit, there could be different paths up different sides of the mountain to use an, an old uh, analogy. Okay, so I wrote a PhD dissertation that went into a 350-page book. I helped my dad update his classic Evidence Demands a Verdict with a team of researchers, and that's about 700-page book. Yours is two volumes that is probably, I'm looking at this one, 1,800 pages with footnotes and everything. What motivated you to spend so much time probing in probably years of your life looking at the topic of universalism? Well, I, I encountered this issue early in my Christian life. This is back in the 70s when I was a, a mm. college at Northwestern University. And I took my, I was a chemistry major and I was in natural science, I was in research before I went into theology. But I had a professor who held that the New Testament teaches universal salvation. This is mm. the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And I was the pesky college student in the back, you know, I was always raising my hand up, you know, commenting and um, th and then I went later, did theological study after I left the field of science at Yale University mm -hmm. and wrote an essay there comparing Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N, an early Christian figure well known as a universalist with Karl Barth, who suggested that we could hope for the salvation of all. And so those were, those were the early seeds. But I think what happened after that is, um, I mean, the Rob Bell book in 2011 oh, yeah. played a pivotal role, Love mm -hmm. Wins. And I remember walking around and seeing a women's group at the local coffee shop, and they were all sitting in a circle, and there were about 10 of them. They had all their copies of Rob Bell open, and they're reading. Wow. And, I mean, I felt a prompting from the Holy Spirit 
to that hmm. this was my job to write this. And I honestly, I didn't want to write this because I knew that this would be highly controversial, particularly in the field of academic theology, where there are so many who, some quietly, some more obviously universalists. I mean, David Bentley Hart is a very well-known, you know, universalist, but there are a lot of a lot of other people that kind of quietly believe that, although they don't, they're you know, teaching seminary, teaching in Bible colleges, some of them, but don't want to really come clean about that. And so I realized this was going to be very controversial, but mm -hmm. I could escape that sense of a, a call to, to do this. And But I had no idea, Sean, how massive the project would be. And um, I it just, it expanded as I worked on it. And I realized that there, you know, I ended up talking about 130 different thinkers over 18 wow. seconds. I tell my grad students who or do PhDs under my direction, like, don't ever take on a topic where you're trying to tell them <laughs> centuries and centuries because so ultimately the book cites about 3,500 sources in five languages, Greek, Latin, English, French, and German, and mm -hmm. about 3,500 footnotes. So it is a, was a massive undertaking, but I, I felt like it had to be done because there just hadn't been a lot of pushback on universalism mm -hmm. started. The train sort of started chugging along with Karl Barth's idea of universal election back in the 1940s. And I found very little deep, analysis and so i felt that needed to be provided and you certainly provided it that's that's for sure there's no debate about that now let's let's talk about something you cover in the book of whether or not universalism is really growing in the church today and i mean on a popular level somebody like rob bell and or on an academic level and if so why do you think it's growing well, I think universalism, for, well, first of all, I, I do believe it's growing. In fact, if you just look at the number of books coming out, and again, that's not a direct measure of how many people are reading the books. But if you look at like Amazon, it's like the old hockey stick, you know, diagram where mm -hmm. um, it goes on a level and then suddenly it, it sort of it, it shoots up into the air. There is a huge uh, increase in the number of books defending, promoting universalism about 1999, so it really something seems to shift as the new millennium is beginning. And then there's just this flood of, of popular literature. There are more and more scholarly academic books arguing the same thing. And I think in my, in my article that's online, people could see opiate of the theologians. I argue that universalism is, it's, it, it agrees with the cultural moment that we're in right now. Uh, because someone who is a Christian believer who embraces universalism. If they're confronted face-to-face -face with their non-Christian neighbor, could be atheist, could be Hindu, Muslim, and that person looks them in the eye and says, are you really telling me that I'm going I'm in trouble if, I'm ha if I've rejected Christ? The universalist can look at them and say, it's, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you don't have to say something offensive about God's judgment and about the eternal destiny, even of hell, of being separated from God if you're a universalist. So it sort of allows the, the universalist belief, the, the Christian believer, to still be a, think of himself, herself as a Christian person without having to be kind of in the face of the non-Christian. And so, um, and, and also the other thing is that I argued in the Opiate of the Theologians article is that we're, I think there's a lot of make-believe and fantasy in our culture right now. I mean, the way that we, our political discussions are taking place and just like you know like we can rack up debt endlessly and there's not going to be a price to pay for that and I, so universalism is the way we would like the world to be we'd like mm -hmm. to think that everyone gladly receives the, the good news of jesus and i compare it to the triumphal entry moment you know that yay jesus you know everyone is cheering they're applauding what if we just run that film endlessly in a loop now <laughs> If we read the gospel, we know that the story ends very differently because the mobs later cry to crucify him. And mm -hmm. so an unsentimental but realistic reading of the gospel is that there is a human turning away from the light. This, the sentimental view of love is that, you know, when God's love is demonstrated, that everyone will respond. If they haven't responded, it's just we haven't shown God's love properly. Mm -hmm. But in John 3, it says that this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. And that's the thing that the universalists are really, really react against. They, you know, the, the underlying assumption is that, no, no, if people are just given the chance or given enough chances, 
everyone will make the right decision. Everyone mm -hmm. will come. Right. And that's not actually what, what Jesus is saying in that mm -hmm. passage. As you see, and I think you're really clear in the book, the gospel itself is really at stake with what position we hold about uh, whether it's universalism or not. Here's a quote that you say. I want to pack, unpack these kind of one by one, I think might help folks. You say in the prologue, a Christian affirmation of final universal inclusion or salvation will affect everything else that one might say about God, humanity, Christ, sin, grace, salvation, and the church. In other words, if you embrace universalism, it affects all these core central doctrines and arguably moves outside the historic Christian church. Before we look at these individually, is that the heart of the point that you're making, that the gospel itself is really at stake? Yes, I, I think everything is at stake. I think everything is at stake. And when you look at the history of, of the universalist movement, which didn't begin in this, this millennium after 2000, there's an earlier history and the unit, universalist church degenerates and becomes merges with the Unitarians. They gave up the divinity of Jesus after they mm -hmm. first gave up uh, the, the idea of, of, of hell and of judgment. Um, so the, yeah, everything is at stake. Um, you begin with God that the, the universe has defined the love of God in separation from the suffering of Jesus on the cross. It's if you understand the, the cross, the cross is, it's really helpful to put the cross at the center. It is the crux, which is literally, of course, in Latin, the, what right. the crux. But we have, it's all, as if the two poles, the, the vertical and the horizontal, or the love and justice of God converge at that moment. It's very hard to understand, unless you have a sense of, of the justice of God, that God's just indignation, opposition to sin, and, and, and punishment for sinners. It's hard to understand why Jesus has to die this horrible death. I mean, couldn't mm -hmm. God have shown love in some other way? And this is a struggle for the universalists. One of the early American universalist leaders, Hosea Ballou, did a treatise in 1805, and it was a treatise on the atonement. And basically what he argues is, God, he's not a punishing God. He doesn't punish sinners. And therefore the cross was not a time where God's justice was being affected against sin. God was judging sin. And so what began to happen very early in the history of these 19th century universes, they began saying, well, the cross is not really an atonement. It's just like a moral example for us, you know? Socrates, the, you know, the Greek philosopher drank the hemlock to maintain, to follow his convictions. Jesus went to the cross following his convictions. But that's radically changing the meaning of the cross. And then mm. what happens is if Jesus is not our sin bearer who atones for sin on the cross, then why does he have to be God? Why does he have to be divine? Maybe he's just a human example. And that's the way the universalist movement in America went. So you see this theological degeneration happening decade by decade until finally they merge with the Unitarians and become the UU Unitarian Universalists. So that's... That's the outcome of, of, of this radical shift in theology. I want to make sure folks don't miss this. What you're arguing is that it's not like you remain a Christian and you just add universal salvation to the mix. If you add universal salvation to the mix, it's going to lead naturally to rethinking what we mean by the character of God, his love and his justice, the nature of yes. sin and how it affects us the identity of Christ and grace. So it's not an add-on. In a sense, would you say it's fair like J. Gresham Machen, of course, said liberal Christianity is not a different version of Christianity. It's an entirely different religion. Is that what embracing Christian universalism, at least historically, has led to? Yes. Yeah, we could. you could demonstrate that from the 19th century. And actually, I'm just saying what the universalist historians so the people who are members or historians of the universalist movement in the 19th century, they say that, yeah, that this, the whole theology began to shift once. Uh, it's like it's like a three-legged stool. It's like you have the doctrine of Jesus' divinity or the tr doctrine of the Trinity. You have the doctrine of the, the cross, the atonement, and then the doctrine of hell. And they're all intricately connected. It's like a chess game, you know, where you have a, a, a junior player, he makes a move, and everyone applauds. He takes someone's bishop. And the grandmaster goes like this. He puts his head in his head because he sees like five <laughs> steps ahead. There's going to be a checkmate ahead. And right, and right. The, the amateur player didn't see where it was going. But but there's no question that like 
as I say in the book, universalism has tremendous curb appeal. So mm. You're driving up or just the initial look, wow, this looks great. Universalists say, you've heard the good news. We're giving you the, the, you know, the, the better news, you know, the very good news. But would you buy a house if you haven't gone into the house and check to see if the plumbing works, get into the crawl space? Maybe it's filled with termites. And I think the, the universalist house, although it looks so good from the curb, it's not actually, theologically speaking, a livable residence. It's, mm. not, it's, it's, not, it's not hospitable over, over time. There isn't any, they're individual universalists, and the universalists will point to that, like, well, what about Gregory of Nyssa? Well, Gregory of Nyssa wasn't part of a congregation you know, around him that all held this universalist view. He privately held this view of universalism, and I, that was true of Origen as well, these mm. early church figures. So I don't, I don't think, I don't see any case where you have a whole congregation that actually embraces universalism, where it does it, it, where things hold together at all. It's like seems to be a recipe for for the the you know the unraveling of the church. So tell me if this is fair. When we look at church history, there's pockets that appear of Christian universalism pretty early within the first few centuries of the church, even before Origin. But these are exceptions. They never make their way into a large denomination, whether that's ultimately Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox, and they don't appear in major creeds and are essentially considered heretical views that were tolerated on some level. Like, just give me the 30,000 foot view of how prevalent universalism has been throughout the large Christian church. Okay, the, the 30,000 foot view is that the people who are promoting Christian universalism today would like to argue that universalism, first of all, is taught in the New Testament, and then that there is this sort of continuous stream of universalists through the centuries, that it was a minority position, but that it existed all through the centuries. And that's not at all what you see. First of all, I, I would strongly contest the idea that New Test the New Testament teaches universal salvation. I think it does not. Yep. And N.T. Wright, the, probably the world's best known biblical scholar who wrote uh, a book even longer than my book on Paul, you know, and the faithfulness of God. He was, I was with a thousand other people listening to him at the Society of Biblical Literature, and he he gets asked, you know, was Paul a universalist? And he said, no, <laughs> no. I mean, just flat out. He said that's usually wow. the first question being asked. But so it's not taught in Scripture. But very tellingly, there's no zero evidence of universalism in the mainstream of Christianity in the second century up to the time of Origin. The, the first the first reference to universal salvation, and I've not found anyone to give me any earlier references, is in the in Irenaeus. He was a second century writer against heresies of the church. He's discussing the Carpocratians, who had a lot of distorted teachings. Mm -hmm. They taught that we the more we sin, the more God is glorified. I mean, this is definitely not a orthodox, biblically minded group. But they taught that in this reincarnation of souls that would go cycle around into bodies one after the other, that um, through that process, finally, all souls will be saved. And that's the exact statement, all souls will be saved. That is about 170 AD. So that's the first reference to universalism that I could find in any literature that was actually mm. dateable. Uh, there's some questions about the Gnostic literature and when that was written. But this is before Origen. But Origen is a figure who really tried to take the universalist message and bring it into some kind of relationship with scripture but he only can do that by developing kind of complicated uh understanding that before adam and eve were in their physical bodies they were pure spirit beings and that they fell from their unity with god this as you've since you've read the book you're aware this is a key argument all through the book the threefold un unity diversity mm -hmm. unit the reason we're that Origen thought that all souls would be with God in the end is that they were with God in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Prior, but this is, you have, to, you have to assume that there's this existence beyond the physical body, the, what you generally call pre-existence. And the contemporary universalists, they would like to hold on to the all souls coming into union with God at the end, but they almost all reject the idea of the pre-existence, and they're missing the, the symmetry that held Origen's thinking together. You kind of Origen said the end is like the beginning. So if you believe that all souls are with God and they fell into the, you know, into their physical bodies, I compare it to like the helium balloon in someone's chest. Okay. You know? you die, it gets released, and then it begins rising. And mm -hmm. if, if that was 
true, then our souls would be saved because of what we are physically, the nature of the soul itself. We wouldn't need a savior. It'd be the nature mm -hmm. of helium that's to rise. And that's kind of what the Gnostics were saying. It was um, salvation because the nature of our souls, they are sparks from God and therefore will return. This is going to sound kind of like new age teaching. And there yeah. is some overlap there at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah, there definitely is. Now, I, I don't want to know if we want to go into too much depth on this because you hinted at it before, but you talk a lot about the universalists that started kind of even in America and they were Trinitarian, cross-centered, Bible-quoting Christians. And this kind of seems like a parable of what just consistently happens when somebody opens the door on certain kinds of different theological perspectives end up where... The universalists did. So what kind of happened historically and doctrinally from where they started to where they might be today? Well, uh, I mean, the, there was a desire uh, in the 19th century, just as today, to want to, you know, expand, um, expand the scope of salvation, you know, to be beyond uh, those who were professing, you know, overt faith in Christ. Uh, in the 19th century, the big debate was over post-mortem suffering. And this mm -hmm. is where this idea of a, something kind of like a Catholic purgatory, although Catholic purgatory, according to Catholic teaching, is only for those who've been baptized as Catholic. It's a third state where people make satisfaction for their sins in penitential fire. You know, they're suffering in fire to be purified. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a very common um, position of the, the universalists in the 19th century. It still comes up today it creates a dilemma, though, because the other group of universalists say, wait a second, didn't Jesus say it is finished at the cross? Didn't he deal completely with all of our sin, make full atonement? And saying, if you believe that we make atonement for our own sins through, you know, fiery suffering after death, then you're, you're denying grace. And But then the argument the other way, and the universe has never been able to resolve this issue, is like, well, wait a second, if everyone goes immediately into God's blissful presence, the moment that they die, then that means um, even the murderer who is, you know, shooting down his victims, laughing yeah. gleefully and taken out by a policeman, he goes immediately to be with God. And they said, mm. there has to be some moral connection between the choices we make and the outcome. And so the 19th century universes, they were more, they were kind of troubled at this thought that it wouldn't make any difference what you, what you did at all. Morally, it would like, it just like God's just going to negate all of the, the moral spiritual choices we've made in this life and, and, and bring everyone to eternal life. So mm -hmm. those are some of the dynamics going on uh, in the 19th century. And, you know, the universalists today have not, they've not resolved it. You know, mm -hmm. like Robin Perry is, calls himself an evangelical universalist and he's quoting Moltmann, but Moltmann says, um, you know, all punishment was taken care of when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, no one will suffer. For their sins everything's covered everything's taken care of that's sometimes called ultra universalism but robin perry himself believes that after people die if they're not ready for heaven they go through a, a fiery kind of purgatory like state so you you mm -hmm. can't really have it both ways you know and i don't uh -huh. think can can quite resolve that mm -hmm. that's a that's a really interesting tension you did make a point in your book that jumped out to me you said a lot of what motivates uh stepping into universalism is the problem of evil and yes. that makes sense none of us like hell none of us like suffering and so i teach a class at biola on the problem of evil and i start by making this point i say a lot of social justice movements of which i would disagree firmly with are motivated by a desire to overcome the problem of evil so there's good motivations but it's misguided in how it plays itself out now, you make this point. I'm curious if you can unpack this a little bit. You said many modern universalists have a personal animus that motivates their writing. And that would seemingly be a lot of Christian universalists. That's my experience only with a few. But tell me about some of the experience that seems to motivate many uh, that they even state in becoming universalists. Well, I think there is a there's a process of of disillusionment sometimes that that occurs. Um, uh, I mean, there, there's a there's a universalist couple that lives in Missouri, Herman, Missouri, and they were missionaries. Actually, they have the this mm. universalist website called Tent Maker. They were tent making missionaries, and um, 
they had a son who did not profess the Christian faith and died suddenly. And in their grief, they began reading 19th century universalist literature, or they became convinced of it. So there really was a personal mm -hmm. desire to, to want to believe that their son was, he was in a good place spiritually after his death, he was with the Lord. Um, so I, and I, you know, I, I found um, in the more recent literature on universalism, a reaction against notions of a sovereign God a God um, who is all powerful saying that's an impressive idea, right? And therefore hell is an impressive idea. The idea that God would make decisions, you know, to commit anyone to, you know, to, uh, to, to hell eternally, that that's a completely unacceptable notion. So I think these things, there are a lot of things that are sort of bound up in that the sovereignty of God, uh, the authority of scripture, concerned about the eternal status of those that we love that are that are that are near to us so i guess those those might be some of the triggers so to speak i don't recall you covering this in your book but i'm wondering if if you've thought about a connection between say certain kinds of technology and belief in universalism so for example when people are able to at least have ships and go to the other side of the world and you start meeting people who see the world differently when we have planes and we can travel the television all of a sudden exposes us. And now with the internet, there's just endless people with different beliefs. And it almost seems emotionally hard to think that you're right and these other people are wrong and going to hell that seems so nice and gracious and they're doing their best. Does there seem to be a connection between kind of technological development and belief in universalism? Does that play a role? Well, certainly the, the exposure to many different cultures if you and if you go back to ancient times, what was the most culturally diverse and intellectually vibrant city of the ancient world would have been Alexandria. Where is Origen coming up with his idea of universalism? Alexandria. Alexandria was like you'd walk down the streets of it. There'd be a snake charmer on one side. There'd be a you know philosopher on the other side. There'd be a temple of Serapis. There'd be Christian communities meeting there. It was this very very eclectic mix of different cultures. They had the largest library in the world, a million scrolls, much of which sadly was destroyed, took destroyed a lot of the knowledge of the ancient world at that point. So that's, and, and the other thing about that is the problem of evil was front and center because the non-Christian philosophers saying your book, the Old Testament has this God who judges people and you know sends fire down from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. And how could you believe in a God like that? So Origen himself and the other thinkers uh, in Alexandria were under tremendous cultural pressure mm. to try to find a way to address that. And this is when Origen comes up with this idea of pre-existence. Well, you know what? There's a reason one person is born poor, another person born fortunate into this world. And it's because of this the sin that was committed in the pure spirit state that caused one to come into a negative situation in life. So he had actually two ways of addressing, you mentioned the problem of evil. One would be the pre-existence. The other is the post-existence, the idea that but everyone ultimately is coming back to God. Those were both ways of, uh, of addressing uh, the problem of evil. And just one other tangent, a little bit to your question. I want to make clear to the, those who are listening or watching that my engagement is with universalism. There is a p position of Christian inclusivism. Mm -hmm. That's not really the primary focus of this book. I think there is a lot of scope for discussion and disagreement among Christians about the, you know, those who have never heard the gospel and exactly how, you know, God will judge them. Universalism, though, is a much more um, radical position because it says that no one, you know, no one, without any exceptions, no one will be lost. Everyone will be saved. So it's like saying, if I make the statement, there are no white crows, you know, it's, it's hard to prove a universal statement like that. Well, there could be, I could go looking for a white crow all through the world and maybe there's one hiding on the other side of the tree. I just didn't notice it. Right. So how do you say that there, you know, that, that, um, everyone without exception. And also if the human will is involved, it's like, uh, it reminds me of the report on the North, North Korean election. You know, Kim Jong-un reported there was a hundred percent turnout. It was a hundred percent for himself. Of and everyone course. laughs at that because <laughs> anything depends on human will. Like all humans are never going to perfectly line up. So is it is it really credible? I mean, to try to claim that, but that's what universalists say. Mm. 
Now, is there a difference in how Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants are being open to universalism? Because you show, historically speaking, in all three of those strains, largely stand with the united front against it. And universal universalist beliefs are the exception. But today, are we seeing an openness in Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant circles, or is there a difference? There, there, there are differences. That there certainly is a greater openness in all of the, of the groups that you mentioned. And just to kind of take them one by one, we could start with the in Catholic world. There's really very little evidence of universalism um, prior to Vatican II, which would have been, that's mm. the major, you know, major uh, council that was held in the 1960s. So um, Jacques Maritain, a French thinker, he's confiding privately to his diary, basically. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone were saved? And he's he's speculating on it, but he doesn't go public with it because it's completely mm -hmm. unacceptable. The ca official Catholic teaching is that if you die in a state of mortal sin, you go immediately to hell. Without You don't go to purgatory, you don't go to heaven, and you will remain in hell forever. So the Catholic doctrine is that you'd have to have no one dying in a state of mortal sin. That's hard to imagine that there was zero people, you know, in that category. Vatican II began to move in a different direction. The idea the Catholic Church was still like the bullseye at the center of the target, so to speak, you know, the, the, the means where people were coming into relationship with God. And then you had a circle around that of the Orthodox, I guess, closest to Catholics, the Protestants, and the Jewish people. Then you could go the outer circles of like Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, atheism, you could debate which of those is closer or further, but the Catholic yeah. Church, was, but it's almost like rather than drawing a single line between those inside and those outside, there are different gradations, degrees of being close to, to God and his truth. And so that kind of, it wasn't universalism, but certainly was opening the door to inclusivism. And then what happened in the 80s is Balthazar, this Swiss theologian, wrote this book, Dare We Hope That All May Be Saved. And that is the book that really opened the Catholic, there was a huge debate back in the 80s, and universalism has been kind of on the table as a possibility or something Catholics have been discussing. In the Protestant world, really the universalist initiatives start on with liberal Protestantism in the 19th century. Um, and I guess it's just pretty recently that, you know, Robin Perry did his book, uh, a, a Evangelical Universalism, um, or sorry, the Evangelical Universalist. He published it under a pseudonym. You know, he didn't use his real name. Yeah, yeah. Greg Donald, yeah. Uh, there actually are some people in the Pentecostal fold who are beginning to, you know, flirt with, you know, universalism. Orthodoxy now is a different, somewhat different case because this massive figure from the early church origin had a great influence on Eastern Christianity through the centuries. But the attitude toward origin was always double-sided that because he was just too important just to completely throw out he's mm -hmm. a major interpreter of scripture he developed the theory of the contemplative life and he was the first to give the spiritual reading in christian context of the song of songs as a, a story of the love of the of the soul for christ and so on mm -hmm. but, but jerome in the early church said that for him origin was like a field strewn with weeds and flowers okay. <laughs> flowers and leave the weeds behind. That's how I would interpret origin as well. I don't think mm. that there's nothing valuable in origin, but the, the area that got origin in trouble that led to his name being inserted at the, the, the fifth ecumenical council, 553, he was named as a false teacher mm. because of his view of, of universal salvation and suggestion. There's a more than a hint that even Satan is going to be finally Redeem. Well, he's Satan would become Lucifer again. He would stop being evil. He would go back to his original goodness as God created him as an angel of light or Lucifer. Um, so he suggests that, and there's uh, there's huge controversy. Uh, Origen is the most one of the most controversial people, you know, in the history of Christianity. And then, um, the, what I found that the historically the Orthodox uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians they always had this this ambivalent feeling about or origin it's only very recently really it's the french jesuits that and uh that mm. kind of rehabilitated origin of the 20th century but now there there are orthodox people saying oh we need to reclaim all of origin and reclaim the universal salvation okay. idea so, so that you know david bentley hart is probably the most famous person in that category he technically is orthodox um but uh but he <laughs> 
He also has told me personally that he doesn't care what the tradition says. He's he, he's committed to universalism. Interesting. That's a really interesting dialogue we could unpack. But let's let's talk about you make this connection between conditionalism and if we allow conditionalism or embrace conditionalism, it seems to logically lead towards embracing universalism. So maybe define what you mean by conditionalism and show why those are connected. Sure. Okay. Conditionalism is the, the, the newer term for what up to fairly recently was sometimes called annihilationism. And now annihilation, it's just not a very positive word. It doesn't have a good vibe. <laughs> Who who's, wants to say, I'm an annihilationist? You know, <laughs> Good point. You're staring in front of me like the Wicked Witch of the West who has the water thrown on her. Um, and so conditionalism or annihilationism is this notion that that there will be a final judgment from God. Mm-hmm. God will separate the one, one, one group from the other, the sheep from the goats. And then um, either immediately or at some point, the goats simply cease to exist. God wills them out of existence or... One common spin on this is that the, the fire of hell is a consuming fire and that those who go into the fire of hell are actually destroyed and they cease to have any existence at all, like burned to ashes, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so in the end, you do end up with a situation where only um, only heaven is populated, but there is literally no one to be in hell because they've all ceased to exist. Um, this is a view that has always had more appeal for whatever reason in Britain than in the U.S. And in fact, Hmm. when the Evangelical Alliance was being put together in the middle of the 19th century, this was an issue even then because there were some British scholars who were inclining toward conditionalism. They believed the Bible, but they they wanted to hold this conditionalist view. And the Americans kind of put their foot down and say, no, you have to believe in in a conscious separation from God, eternal separation, conscious, continued existence. And so that but then John Stott, who yeah. is a well evangelical British scholar, very highly reputed and a personal chaplain to Queen Elizabeth, um, he began to shift toward conditionalism. And actually, in the, the Evangelical Alliance, the British manifestation of that, he shifted some of the language just subtly to allow the, the conditionalists to still be, call themselves and be a part of the Evangelical uh, Alliance there. But so what I noted in my book is that the arguments used for conditionalism are pretty similar to the arguments used for universalism. One of them that Stott himself used is he said that he could not picture a final outcome where there were some like holdout, you know, of Mm. of rebels against God, like in their underground, you know, caverns or, you know, refusing to yield obedience. And he said, wouldn't that be a defeat? for God, if that were the case. And so for him, again, this is this is the problem here, Sean, this is a priori reasoning. I'm starting with my own yeah. initial, and I'm reasoning downward from those to what seems reasonable. And therefore, you know, if you decide your eschatology, I, I like to say, that if you start your sentence with, you know, if I were God, then say, well, stop, don't even finish a sentence. You know, if I were God, this is how I would create the world, right? Because you're not God, right? You know, it's kind of above our our pay grade, but Stott engaged in that kind of thought. And so that for him made it more, made conditionalism or annihilationism more, more attractive to him. But, but it's what happened, it's kind of a moot point because what actually happened among younger British uh, Christians, and I lived in England twice. I was actually a professor at the University of Birmingham in England. I found the younger generation that were inclined toward, uh, annihilationism had shifted from annihilation into universalism. So now oh. annihilationism has become kind of a moot point. You wouldn't know this from looking at the literature because there's still debates going on about annihilationism, but I don't really, I don't find that they're a very large group. I think there, there, there are many more universalists in the younger generation and they tend to be assertive universalists of the David Bentley Hart type, not just like, this is something we didn't bring up, but the hopeful universalism is the view that we can hope for the salvation of all, but we can't assert it. Well, that middle position is sort of dropping out, and now we're getting we're getting the traditional view of particularism that there are two final destinations, and that we can know that from Scripture. And then the David Bentley Hart, the assertive universal position. 
that, that God, that everyone will be saved. In fact, David Bentley Hart says, if you're a moral imbecile, moral imbecility, if you don't affirm that. Very, very sweeping statement. Wow, that's strong. That's really strong. Now, the point that you made between conditionalism and between universalism is kind of a theological a priori about God and his justice and the way he operates in the world. Of course, there's right. biblical arguments that people will make. Are you finding mm -hmm. that a lot of the universalists now, the younger ones, are making these kind of a priori theological commitments about God being loving, about God caring for the world, about his character, biblical arguments, or are they making both? Well, the I mean, the arguments are framed, uh, you know, as biblical arguments, but there's just so much in Scripture that you have to uh, reinterpret in, in some way. And mm -hmm. it doesn't begin with the discussion of heaven and hell in the New Testament. It begins with the two ways motif. You know, this is in the second chapter of the Bible. In the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. You know, it's like consequences follow from choices that are made. Psalm 1 says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, the way of the wicked will perish. It doesn't mention hell, but it says the wicked will not stand in the day of judgment. There's some idea of distinction, separation. Isaiah chapter 1 says, if you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Again, that's that you say, well, maybe that's talking about a this worldly destiny. Yes, yeah. but through scripture, there's a very clear idea of these different outcomes for the righteous and the wicked, depending on how they respond to whatever revelation God has presented. And the universalists want to set that aside. And then there's some texts that are just so clear in the New Testament, like in Luke 13, where someone asked Jesus, are there many who will be saved? And Jesus, first thing he says is strive to enter by the, the narrow gate. Mm. So he basically pay attention to yourself. Don't get caught up in the speculation about other people. Pay attention to yourself. But then he said, for truly, I say to you, many will strive to enter and will not be able. And if you're a universalist, you have to take a text like that and say, oh, well, it's just a temporary block. You know, you have to add something that's not in the text. Say, well, or how about the, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins they are knocking on the door? The door of the, the, the wedding feast is shut, you know, Um and they can't get in. You have to say, well, that, that only lasts for a period of time. And then there's another opportunity beyond that. Well, but scripture doesn't say that. And so this all important issue of salvation, you're actually causing your belief to be dependent on some hypothetical further condition that isn't actually directly taught in scripture. And that seems to me like a very dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just going to assume that the door to the feast, even if it's shut, is going to open right. again. Like, right. Even though the text doesn't say that, I, I just because this is what I believe about God, He gives endless opportunity. He never forecloses, as one of the universes said. He never forecloses mm -hmm. on anyone. So the door must open again. Well, but that's not what Scripture says. And there's this this sense of warning and urgency that comes through in the parables of Jesus about judgment. Mm -hmm. So you're trained is in history. You got a PhD at the University University of Chicago, and have taught history. And this. Two volume book again. We're talking about the Devil's Redemption. Is yeah, actually historical theology. So oh, yeah, I'm okay. my in theology, but I did historical, so it's history of theology. But it was more under the theology than the history category. Excellent, good. So this book is really. It struck me as primarily a historical look, but through the lens of theology. But when you get to the end, you raise theological and philosophical critiques of universalism. Now, we're not going to do this justice, obviously. We could. There's so many more arguments here, but you kind of put them in three categories. Let's kind of take them one by one, and maybe you could explain to us and why you think this is problematic and concerning for u universalism. The first mm -hmm. one you call the problem of God. Explain. Yes. Yeah. A common view of universalists is that um, that when God created the world, that God had to, in effect, diminish himself to bring himself down to our level so that God was sort of relatable. And they really have this shifted view of God. And I found this in um, some called panentheism. Kevin Van Hooser, well-known evangelical theologian, calls it, uh, well, he's a fancy name, calls it canonic relational ontotheology, which is quite a... <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, here's my analogy for this. It'd be like... Um, if a school teacher, let's say, in some 
some school where there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of misbehavior and violence. Or it's a school. Let's imagine the school teacher could not expel any student from her classroom, right? So students in the back are I don't know they're smoking marijuana in the corner, they're lighting fires in the wastebasket, and and she can give them a five minute time out, you know, on the side of the room, but she can't actually say out of my room. There is a view of God among these relational theologians that God God actually cannot exclude any of his creatures. He's like obligated to maintain relationship with them. So that's mm. a really, I think a, it's a non-biblical view of God. Also mm. the idea that creation is God l lowering or limiting himself. Martin Luther said that to create is to command. He saw that creation was an expression of divine omnipotence and power, the power of God, also the wisdom of God, and then the goodness of God. He made all things very good. So I think we have at the very outset with some of these relational canonic theologians, we have a distorted image of, of the nature of God. Mm -hmm. And then there's also this strange idea, and again, this is getting off, uh, maybe too far off from our main topic, but this okay. drama within God, um, Jewish Kabbalah taught that there's a left mm -hmm. and a right side of God and they're in conflict with one another, and God has to reconcile with himself. And as God reconciles with himself, all creatures become reconciled. And so that's a non-biblical idea that like that evil originates within God. And that's an idea that some modern theologians embrace. There's distance, there's a yeah. fall within God, and then God has to, and like Lucifer and Christ are like the two sons of God, and they have to be united together with one another. This is, this is esoteric, Gnostic type of thinking. So there's a problem. There's a problem yeah. with, 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 the, with the way we think of God. It's interesting how much you talk about, you said Kabbalah, Gnostic ideas kind of seeping into how Christians view God rather than in Scripture. That's kind of at the root of this. Now, the second one, which to me was one of the most interesting points in the book, is what you call the problem of grace. Explain that one, if you will. Well, the... There, the problem is that, gra that grace is God's, you know, we could define it just roughly, uh, as I think many preachers would, God's unmerited favor. God is not obligated to give grace. Mm -hmm. And the paradox of, of universalism is by extending grace to everyone, grace is in effect abolished because grace becomes mandatory. It becomes, it, God's job is to ensure that everyone is saved. And so <laughs> if that's your view, then grace is actually not, it's not gracious. It's, it's, it's God's, you know, it's God's responsibility. It reminds me, Heinrich Heine, he was a German writer and, and someone said something to him about God on his deathbed. His supposed last words were, God will forgive me. That's his job, you know? Mm. And, and that's kind of the idea that in contemporary culture, it's like it's God's responsibility to save everyone. So the, the graciousness of grace is lost. That grace is really something that God freely gives. In, 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 and um, so, so anyway, it's, it's, it is an irony that, that, that grace would be undermined by the people who think that they're, that they're emphasizing it. Yeah, that's, fa that's fascinating that it would undermine, in many ways, the root of what makes Christianity distinct from other faiths is that it's grace and it's not earned that gets undermined in a movement that tries to give grace to everybody really gives grace in a sense in the way it's biblically understood to nobody. You could make that case. So you have right. the problem of problem of God, problem of grace, and then you have what's called the problem of belief. Hmm. Yeah, the problem of belief is that we that you know the, the we we don't have a firm promise in scripture hmm. anywhere for the salvation of all. Biblical hope is not wishfulness. It'd be like I say wouldn't it be nice if there were no poor people in the world? Wouldn't it be nice if there was, there's horror, we read stories right now about violence, Hamas and Israel. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was peace between them, right? Um, do, do we have a reasonable expectation that peace will break out all around the world? Not if we look at you know thousands of years of recorded history. Um, so if we look at the general experience of the world, it doesn't really support the hope we have. And if we had some text that really taught the salvation of all, um, you know, there, there are some who cite certain verses that, you know, out of context, I think if you look at those in context, there are two or three that are, that, that are often cited in this connection. So we don't have the clear promise of God. And so this 
you know, this idea that all will be saved, ultimately I would put it in the category of wishfulness rather than biblical hope. Mm. Um, and, and, and then the, the tradition of the church is, is very clear too, that, um, that the, you know, the one of the examples going back to the title of my book, you know, devil's redemption is that church has always churches throughout history have always prayed for sinners of even mass murderers, rapists, kidnappers, those who committed all kinds of crimes have always been had people praying for them. But I, I defy anyone to show me a liturgical prayer, like a written prayer hmm. that we have in history for the salvation of Satan. It's like it doesn't exist, right? And what that means is that there was just a very clear awareness in every part of the world through the centuries that God has created certain spiritual beings who are never redeemed. They never come back into relationship with God. And so the starting point of some universalists, you see, it kind of undercuts their starting point. God would never create an intelligent being that he would then allow to become alienated from him forever. Well, we know for certain, about as certain as we can be of anything, that Satan is not redeemed in the end. It's thrown into the lake of fire. You know, the first scene he appears in scripture, he's tempting the woman, and then Revelation, he's thrown, I'm tempted to say, kicking and screaming, right, into the lake of fire. So that there's no, and, and you know, that there's no um, hint of any demon, there's, you know, that the demons can be redeemed. There's no sermons given to them. They're never asked to repent. Um, yeah. So there's, when Adam and Eve and the serpent, you know, when the serpent tempts Adam and Eve to sin, then there's, there's a hint of redemption that the, the seed of the woman, says in Genesis 3.15, will crush the head mm -hmm. of the serpent. And so that the hope of redemption is the serpent being crushed, not the serpent himself being redeemed. So, okay. So in Universalist, not only are we talking about the universal salvation of human beings, but do demons and Satan always come along with this, or do some just say, "Nah, Satan's still going to hell," but Christians are or human beings are universally saved? Well, I think this is a dilemma for the Universalists. Honestly, I think it's a dilemma mm -hmm. because uh, there's some who just want to ignore the question. And uh, they're, they're really, um, I guess there are just a couple of options. Well, that uh, one is to, um, to say yes, that Satan and the demons are redeemed in the end. Um, the other would be to say, well, Satan is a, is a kind of figure of speech. There aren't actual oh, okay. Okay. conceit. Of it. So um, I think Robin Perry kind of wrestles with that. I don't mm. see how you say that, you know, that all human beings are saved, but no angels are redeemed. It, it, that seems like an unstable position for the universalists mm -hmm. because the same kinds of arguments for every human universal human salvation would seemingly apply to the angels. So I think it's a it's a problem that that's not been resolved. One of a number of problems in universalist theology. So we're going to look at just a couple of passages, and I wish we had time to go into way more depth on these that are cited biblically to support universalism. But you make a point that it's not just looking at these verses and interpreting them differently. Universalists tend to take a very different interpretive methodology or hermeneutic to the text and thus come up with a universalist interpretation. What tends to be that hermeneutic that is brought to the text you see universalists consistently utilizing? One is... Uh, is rejecting the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament mm. versus New Testament. I mean, and this is an old theme in Protestant liberal theology, the angry God of the Old Testament versus mm -hmm. the loving God of the New Testament. I think most universalists have uh, much, have difficulty in reconciling their, their universalist views, if looking at the whole of scripture, right? So, so a lot would want to limit themselves just to the, the New Testament. And then there is a tendency uh, to, um, to take spiritual reading sometimes, spiritual interpretations. For instance, some of the, the theologians that inclined toward universalism in the 20th century, um, John A.T. Robinson, he, he had this view, this existentialist view that when Jesus talks about the fire of hell in Gehenna, or would be the, would be the Greek word, that he's pointing toward the universal human dilemma of decision that we make moment by moment in all of our lives. It's not about a specific outcome that pertains to you, you know, after you die. It's like all of us are every moment standing 
I'm thinking of that old REM song, you know, choosing my religion. This or like <laughs> they, every single moment choosing my religion. So it's, it's it's like, well, what does that have to do with the teaching of Jesus? That's like reading a kind of 20th century philosophical movement back in the text. But that's another move, existentializing. Mm. Uh, Karl Rahner called it threat discourse, which is a weird way of saying like, well, there really isn't a threat, but it's sort of, I don't know, people are motivated by a threat, but there isn't actually a, any danger connected with that. Um, the, the, other, the other move in terms of interpretation or hermeneutics is to say that there are two different Pauls. There's a universalist Paul and then there's a particularist Paul. And if you, to, to believe that, you'd actually have to wow. say that like, Paul really was of two minds. Like the great mm -hmm. apostle of the Gentiles is author of so much of the New Testament. He didn't even, wasn't even sure himself as to whether everyone would be saved or wouldn't be saved. And it, it just, it strains, you know, mm -hmm. our, you know, credulity to the breaking point. Yeah, that the apostle would not have this resolved. And then if you, if you look at the, you know, the passages, I mean, Romans 5.18. I've yeah, in let's front look of me. at these. Go ahead. So, so let me, oh, go ahead. Yeah, through, then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Full stop. Now, this is sometimes quoted out of context to, to favor universalism, but the very next verse doesn't speak of all, it speaks of the many. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Now, that should immediately put a question in your mind why is mm. it, it paul's seem to speak you know kind of seems to be loose in the way he's using vocabulary just some like say well did did uh did everyone come to the party on saturday night yeah they were all there well that's that's a loose way of speaking there may have been one person who was expected to the party who didn't come and so there's it seems to be kind of a looseness and then even more profoundly what about the beginning of chapter five of romans therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is everyone a believer? I don't think so. You know, and if the whole theme of the chapter is justification by faith, how does that fit in with the universal, universalist reading of the of the latter part of the chapter? So I, I think there's some pretty convincing responses on that. And I just want to point out to viewers, what you did is if, if you take this verse individually within itself, it seems to lend itself to a possible universalist interpretation but if you look at the book of romans as a whole and you can even make a case from romans 1 but of course you stick within the context itself let's look at the verses before those after uh paul is clearly saying something else another verse that's used often to defend universalism is colossians 1 20 which is also paul of course and uh maybe you want to turn there if not i'll read it for folks to to have it in the so they're tracking with us. Colossians 1.20 says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And the key that people say is whether on earth or in heaven, reconciling all things to himself. So the argument is, therefore, at some point in the future, there's going to be reconciliation of all things to God through the blood of Jesus. Well, there's there's also a good response to this, and it's it's from basic knowledge of Greek. Anyone who's done a Greek course will understand that something in Greek called the intent clause, you know. So, so I might say Sean McDowell invested a thousand dollars of his money in order that that he might increase his investment. Right. That doesn't mean that Sean McDowell ended up with twelve hundred or fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars from his thousand dollar vision. That's a clause pointing toward an outcome, right? It's not mm -hmm. an assertion that the outcome occurred. So that's what we have here: that 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 the fullness, the Father's good pleasure, all the fullness dwelt in Him, and, and the Father's intent, His good pleasure, eudokia is a Greek word, to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross through Him. I say things whether on earth or things in heaven. So this is the intent of God. Think of the verse that is often quoted in this connection. It says, God desires all men to be saved. Mm. And come to the knowledge of the truth. That's in that's in First Timothy. And then in Second Peter, there's a verse that says, yeah. yeah, that he's not willing that any should perish, but mm -hmm. that all might come to mm. repent. Okay, notice that. That's another, that's another intent clause, right? 
that all might come to repentance. Is that saying that all do come to repentance? No, that's a that's just a very basic grammatical misunderstanding of the syntax in the passage. Mm -hmm. And that, that's true, I think, of the Colossians text as well. And then if you, know, you look on the other side, you know, in First Thessalonians 1, it says it's just unambiguous, and the universalists themselves don't know what to say about that. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, or could be from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's, that's Second Thessalonians 1, 9. That's so clear. I don't think there's much wiggle room on that one. Mm. Well, there's a lot more verses we could look at. We won't do that here, but I think this is enough for people to realize that there is a weight of Scripture talking about the reality of some who were saved, some who were not. And you make the point in the book that the idea Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant circles, there's a place called hell, it's eternal, and some people are going to end up there Hence, we should pray for people and pray for their salvation and warn people against such a fate. Historically right. and theologically, there's such a weight here that to embrace universalism, you're going to have to make some pretty strong biblical arguments that you argue in your book certainly have not been made yet. Uh, let, let me just bring it back full circle. What's at stake here? Is there anything that we missed moving forward, kind of in this cultural moment where it's becoming more and more acceptable? Uh, pastors in the church, I'm seeing apologists and others embracing this. What's at stake here? And how much should Christians stand firm against and be concerned about this movement towards embracing universalism? Well, there, there's one view of universalism that says, well, it's a kind of benign or you know harmless mistake that some people make. Maybe they're hoping too much, right? Hoping for too much. And actually, if we look in Scripture, we see that false hope can be a very dangerous thing. Mm. Um, in the book of Jeremiah, um, the people in that day, now this is not dealing with eternal outcomes, but there sure. is this, 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 this threat of the invasion by Babylon. And the people were convinced that this could, would never happen. God would never allow the temple to be invaded. Ch Gen uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So this sort of nationalist ideology, and Jeremiah is speaking against that. And you see the tragic result of this um, false belief. And that false belief that that Jerusalem was, you know, was never going to be invaded, the judgment was never going to fall on the city despite all their sin, that was reinforced by the false prophets in Jeremiah's day. And and Jeremiah says that they, they speak to the people, they say, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And I see the, 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 the proclamation of universalism today in that, in that light. I think it's, a, it's like the false prophecy of our day. It's saying peace, peace, there is no peace. It's, it's telling people not to be concerned, not to be, uh, to be attentive to their own uh, situation and circumstance and that of, of those around them. Um, and, and the other thing maybe to say, you know, was, you know, in closing is that this does not mean that those who speak of hell and of judgment are taking delight in the suffering of other people. The Germans have a word for that. They call it schadenfreude. It's delight in someone else's misfortune. We see it every day on the tabloids, you know, where the, the media stars and Hollywood actors and actresses, you know, they're going through divorces. And that gets reported because there's a part of us many of us i think that kind of delights in the thought of this they're they're wealthy and powerful but look at how they're suffering and some think that that's what lies behind this doctrine of hell and it's like no it's the point is that that scripture makes it clear that there is objective not subjective objective danger and risk to hearing about christ and rejecting christ and so you're no more a, a fear monger in talking about the reality of, of future judgment, then you would be a fear monger if a building catches fire and you're shouting to someone on the upper floor, there's a fire, get out of the building right away. The fire's on the you know, first floor, it's moving on up the, you know, the apartment building. That's not fear mongering. Or if the, someone is working with dangerous chemicals and you say a sign to say, you know, you know, danger, you know, cyanide kills, that's not fear mongering because we all agree that cyanide is objectively dangerous. The problem with, with this discussion about hell and judgment is that, that the, the non-believing world and a significant part even of the Christian world has been affected with the idea that there really isn't any danger or risk. And so we mm -hmm. can kind of downplay that risk. And so I think we have to, if we're biblically minded, we have to realize, we have to stay close to what scripture actually says about this. And that means 
being willing to um, to talk about uh, the reality of judgment. Um, I appreciate that you said if we are biblically minded, because at its core, it comes back to biblical authority and biblical teaching, doesn't it? That's the heart of it. And if yes. we are Bible following Christians, we've got mm -hmm. to bring it back to Scripture. Mike, really appreciate you coming on. At some point, since your last name is McClymond and I'm McDowell, you must have some Scottish in you. So we must be related somehow when we go back in the past, which is kind of fun. But you told me really fast, there's only two McClymonds in America. Did I hear you say that? Is I, it that small? Two, two Michael McClymonds that I, that oh, I know about. Oh, got it. Someone okay. The sandwich shop in the Bay Area near my sister who lives there. And so I... He get uh, he's got good reviews online. So now, if he's my identical twin, then who knows? That that would be surprising. Fair enough. Well, there's one other Sean McDowell I'm aware of. He like sells shoes and has a website. And so, never met him. If you're out there, we should meet. Actually, there's a third. He used to be a radio show host. But anyways, that aside, I really enjoyed your two volume set, The Devil's Redemption. And like I said, I read probably ninety percent of it. It's eighteen hundred words, and I like to recommend books to my viewers, but I want you to know this is not an easy, quick afternoon read. This is going to take you hours and hours to work through. Careful detail. It's very readable. And it's kind of a study in church history through the lens of views on salvation and views on universalism. As I said at the beginning, if we ever had a course on universalism, these are the texts that I would apply. Mike, really enjoyed it. We're definitely going to have to have you back to talk about other topics and stay on top of your research. But before those of you click away, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other topics coming up. We're going to discuss hell in the future. We're going to come back to universalism again in due time, but all sorts of issues related to worldview and culture. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss it. And if you thought about studying apologetics, we have the top-rated full-distance program at Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. I teach classes on the problem of evil, resurrection, have an upcoming class on biblical sexuality. Would love to have you in class. And if you're like, I want to study apologetics, not ready for master's, we have a, a certificate program with a significant discount below. We'd love to guide you through that. Mike, thanks for coming on, my friend. Let's do this again. Thank you.